Okay, um, so my name's Tim. Um, I'm from UK Uncut. Um, I'm also doing a PhD at the moment at Warwick University, which is kind of interesting being in this kind of setting. I've got my PhD first year of you next week, so <laughs> this is good practice. Um, so I'll just introduce myself a bit, because it might be interesting for you um, to know about how I came into UK Uncut from the beginning. Um, I guess I started, in, started getting involved in political activism at university um, in 2000, 2003, doing Iraq war protests, and then I moved into working as a volunteer uh, and then an intern at, um, at Campaign Against Arms Trade, working on military research at UK universities and ethical investment, because a lot of uh, UK universities invest in arms companies. And um, then I moved to campaigning against nuclear weapons. Um, I guess, in a nutshell, my interest around that time and still today was to find, in terms of participation, a kind of a movement or a group that really spoke to me and my values and my interests and that I felt I could fit into and feel that I could participate fully with my own interest and my own outlook, which is probably towards the libertarian, socialist, anarchist sense, even though I didn't, wouldn't really have called it that in the beginning. I wouldn't really have known how to use that language or describe myself in that way, but that's what I kind of have understand it to be that was kind of um, non-hierarchical. And that's really what really got me into campaign this arms trade, because it said on its website, it's non-hierarchical, which sounded really cool and interesting, and mm -hmm. that I could be part of something that wouldn't be told what to do. And it also had quite a radical critique of politics and the state and state practices, whereas I felt mainstream political parties didn't really speak to me at all. But it didn't really have an oppositional, confrontational sense with power, with capital, and all those kind of things. Um, yeah, so that's kind of something that stayed with me, that kind of sense of my own personal politics and where I belong in the movement, as it were. Um, so as well as doing like professional work, like paid work in, like, for NGOs, in the peace movement specifically, which has been an interesting experience because that kind of has a certain way of doing things, a more traditional left way of doing things. I also was involved in more kind of like volunteering kind of grassroots grassroots movements and key, a key experience for me in that was my first experience of direct action was with Campaign Against Arms Trade where we interrupted um, the London Book Fair because it was, uh, it was organised by the people who also organised the, the arms fair at Dicey um, and through Campaign Against Arms Trade I got involved with direct action campaigners and activists and that led to me going to different climate camps, I don't know if you know about climate camps so that's occupying, it's like an environmental protest group which basically organised like occupations of land nearby areas or sites where they wanted to stop projects which they thought would be bad for the environment like Heathrow, uh, airport expansion, Kings North, gas -fired, uh, coal fired power station and similar. Um, and they're kind of very flat, horizontalist, direct democracy uh, way of organising, but with very fun, creative, imaginative, very kind of exciting, uh, youth-oriented move, movement building and action, civil disobedience, that kind of built on the roads movement, anti-roads movement, and the kind of reclaim the streets movements of the 80s and 90s, really kind of got me thinking and made, got me making lots of more of connections and networks with people. Um, I wasn't involved in the Star of UK and Cup, but um, I knew people who were. Uh, I came into a bit, a little bit, a few months later, but as I said, it was basically started, the first protest was on Oxford Street. Uh, about a week or two after the announcement of the Comprehensive Spending Review, the biggest cuts, uh, the unprecedented spending cuts, which have now amounted to over 100 billion over a decade for the Conservative government. And um, so the main, the main protest target here was Vodafone because it came come out in the media um, for example, through a journalist called Johan Hari in The Independent and other tax justice campaigners that they'd avoided six, paying £6 billion in tax, which may be as much as £9 billion. And clearly, like, the, key, the clear message there, which you've got there, which has basically been continuous throughout UK and Cut, was that you know, if you avoid tax, then that means that 
the burden will fall on other people. That means that essentially you're rewarding corporations for that having power and being able to employ expensive accountants to get around tax loopholes. And that you know, you're on our high streets, you're in our communities, but you're not paying your fair share at a time when we're saying we're all in together, like we mentioned yesterday. It seems a natural kind of injustice and lack of inegalitarian values and inequality that they have all this money, they're making massive profits, they're making massive bonuses, but they were not paying their fair share, not paying their tax. So it basically, this, this first protest in Oxford Street was just like, a, a like 10 to 20, 30, maybe not that many people really. But it really actually, it, um, it really made an impact. Pe people s stood up and took notice, I think, like not just in London, which is where it was on Oxford Street, but around the country. And it was kind of like, uh, it kind of snowballed very quickly. And uh, you had kind of copycat or similar protests taking place. Oops, is that going to work? This one. In other towns and cities across the UK, like in a matter of weeks or months. And so there were a series of weeks, a weekend, every Saturday, there was like, for a, long, a, a few Saturdays in a row, there were like flash mob style occupations in Vodafone stores around the UK. And people like took the frame of this very simple idea of, you know, we are, you know, you should be paying your tax, we need it to stop spending cuts. And they adapted it themselves and interpreted themselves in their own locations. Um, you know, there were different degrees of uh, confrontation and crossing boundaries, like, so were they going into the stores, were they not going into the stores? How willing were they to like cross that boundary and, and risk arrest? But on the whole, there was a sense that people were doing this together and it was coming together and everyone shared this feeling of frustration and resistance and the need to do something else and outrage and anger against uh, the tax dodging. Um, okay, um, what should I mention now? Okay, so yeah, what we'll talk, I'll just talk you maybe through about the evolution of the group and then maybe pick out a few key issues and themes in a kind of haphazard style and we can, if any of them interest you, we can you can ask me about them a bit later because there are a few different things to mention. So the next kind of, basically there was like a more of a, as more stories came out about tax dodging, as more targets came to light, more companies, the media were picking up on it, they were doing more investigations and we were being fed with more stories. So the next one that really came out was, as well as like people like Boots and Tesco's, it was uh, Topshop. It's is owned by, it's part of the Arcadia Group, owned by Sir Philip Green. And basically what come to light is that I think it was about 2005, he'd awarded himself a big payout, uh, but diverted it to Monaco in the name of his wife, and so avoided £285 million in tax. So there was a big occupation in um, the flagship store on Oxford Street. And as you can see, like the type of people who are involved here, this was around the time, if you may remember, there was the big student demo, which is very important for kick-starting kick a sense of resistance and more radicalism. And that was when, you know, uh, Tory HQ Millbank was kind of attacked and the glasses, glass windows were smashed and things like that. And that was, there was more kind of a kind of intense, ex a buzzy, vibrant atmosphere around like protests at that time, flash mobby actions. So a lot of people there, you can see a very young kind of students um, who are kind of part of that sense of those, that four or five month window um, of much more kind of like um, engagement in these protests. And so it was basically, uh, these kind of protests are very, they're quite short. They take place on Saturdays where like people have a window of time. They don't, so they don't require that much. You don't, you just basically have to show up. You can show up with your own like placards or posters. You, you know, you can, there's no real kind of sense of a leadership network taking you from one place to the other. You can make the protest what you will within the frame that's kind of provided at a certain time and a certain place with your friends. And so it's very DIY, very homemade. And um, so that kind of, and that's reflected in the people who took part. So um, next kind of things were, so this is quite a cool, so it carried on and we kind of like built more kind of targets into it. We we're trying to think about how we can also build the idea of the banks into it, because obviously the, the point was that by now, messaging was also developed into the idea, well, at the start, it was like, you know, the government are telling us lies, there is an alternative to the cuts, we have to clamp down on tax avoidance, because it was the banks that called the economic crisis, but the poorest, the most marginalised in society are the ones who are being punished and being made to pay for it. The idea was, it's quite difficult to, and it's proved quite difficult to really target and protest against the banks, because they're quite an amorphous 
entity, if you like, and what is the cause of the economic crisis? What responsibilities did the banks have? How do you get reform? What do you call for? What do you ask for about the banks, specifically as a campaign demand, because it's such a big thing. So our main thing was about, like, probably, in a nutshell, was like, we need to transform the banks so they kind of um, serve, like, real human needs of society. So we basically transformed branches of banks like Barclays, who also turned out to be a big tax dodger and paid a very small amount of tax in 2009, about 1% um, of what they should have been doing, uh, or 1% of their earnings in terms of income tax, corporation tax. Um, so we're turning into, like, in this instance, we turned it into a crash, which is why the child is there. <laughs> she hasn't just been abandoned by her mother. And, you know, we're so we're basically transforming branches of banks in uh, different towns and cities across the UK into creches and other services that are being, being cut by the government, like libraries. So one of the ones I did was in Islington, and we basically like, turned um, an Islington branch of Barclays into a library, we're, like trying to take books out of the cash machines. It was, you know, it's, it's light humid, it's good humid, but so it's kind of got this mixture of like, you're crossing a boundary, you're being slightly confrontational, but you're doing it in a kind of light-hearted, humorous way, so you kind of get away with it. And that also allows more people to get, to, to get involved. So people have started to bring along, kids along, started to bring families along, which is a really positive sign of like, you know, this was a protest for everyone, and we kind of, people were kind of picking on, like, yeah, that's what we really want to do. We want everyone to be part, can be part of this protest. Um, so that was quite good. Um, so, yeah, so throughout, so from 2010 to about middle of 2011, it was mainly about the tax dodgers and the banks, and linking it to, for example, we did one in the banks called Emergency Operation, where we were turning banks into, like, NHS emergency wards or like kind of surgeries and dressing up as like doctors and nurses and doing die-ins and stuff like that. And then we kind of, this was a kind of a new tactic. We're trying to, so it wasn't just flash mobs, but there were also other different kind of tactics that we were using throughout the group's life. This one was um, one of the biggest, I think, demonstrations against the NHS. Again, it was a sense that uh, we can't just have as much as good, as useful, as productive as candlelit vigils and other kind of slightly more passive protests are, there needs to be a sense of much more kind of resistance and direct confrontation with power. So this was like um, uh, basically occupying Westminster Bridge because there's uh, the road here links um, num uh, uh, Big Ben and House of Commons with Guys and St Thomas's Hospital on the other side. So the idea was really to like block the bridge and block the bill, so block the um, health and social care bill from passing from House of Commons across the bridge to St. Guy's and St. Thomas's in a kind of symbolic way. And like this kind of very spectacular mass protest demo is the kind of thing that really like, you know, is very good for media coverage. Because I think the other thing that I'm going to highlight a bit more is that You Can Cut's been successful in terms of really like focusing very hard on how we channel our media messaging and know how to pick the right targets and make sure the media know where to go. So we have very good media communications and developed very strong media links and media knowledge of how to get our messages across, very disciplined in our messaging and how we interact with the media. Like, I can't emphasize that enough and building relationships and knowledge of what the media want and how we can give them to that, give it to them. Because they basically want images, they want pictures and they want good people who can give good interviews. Um, so that was important for us. And there's also a sense of building um, links with networks of people directly affected by the cuts and activists in the movement more widely. So built, uh, working with NHS activists, Keep Our NHS Public and People's Health Assembly. And it's also um, important to note that this action actually took place four days or five days or maybe a week before Occupy London um, of the St Paul's Cathedral. And so I was on this bridge and there was, a, there was an assembly actually in the middle of the bridge that took place here. Um, and that was where it was agreed to go ahead with the occupation of uh, St Paul's Cathedral, which led to Occupy London. So this is kind of like a meeting place, a kind of place where people make links and connections, have assemblies, use consensus decision making, direct democracy, real like face-to-face -face decision making in a circle with a facilitator with an agenda. You know, and everyone, anyone can sit in that. And I think that's a really interesting point to make in terms of the difference between the real direct democracy and consensus decision making of groups like this and Occupy, 
and the kind of representative parliamentary democracy of hierarchies and like formal processes. And so those two, the diff, the, uh, what we are talking about before a little bit was mentioned, how those worlds mesh is, is very challenging. They basically, it's like people playing completely different types of music. It's like pop music and rock music, or, or, and uh, pop music, rock music, and classical music. Like how do you, they're playing different instruments. They're, they're not, they're both music, but they're playing a different tune. So how do you get those people to be in concert with each other, really? It's very difficult. You need, once people say, we need a conductor, but we're like, well, we don't want a conductor. We just want to play our own instruments, you know, <laughs> for a crude metaphor. Um, then, like, another thing to say is, like, um, these kind of more solidarity actions with unions. So at union demos, like TUC demos, we'd kind of, people would come along and they'd like, give out tea to the workers and people demonstrating and just so solidarity, you know, it's kind of like a little nice thing. And by that time, kind of unions were getting more interested in what we were doing and we were trying to connect with them, connect with their members, maybe radicalise the unions a bit, try and make links there. That was quite an important thing to start doing. So it was really the idea of, like, evolving the group building our messaging, building the network, engaging with more kind of groups. And this led to this action, which was um, led by the Disabled People Against Cuts in the beginning of 2012. And it was basically a blockage of Oxford Circus in central London. Uh, I know that most of these actions look like they're all taking place in London, but that's only because they're the ones that I was at. <laughs> so <laughs> these are the photos I have. But there were things taking place around London. It's important to mention that. Um, so yeah, this was about uh, the idea of like stopping or blocking the welfare reform bill. So blocking uh, this important junction in the heart of central London. And again, it was for us about really linking up with people who are directly affected by the cuts and learning from their struggles and understanding them so that we would better be able to develop better targets, represent them better, work with them better. And, you know, again, like broaden the movement as it were. And that also they would share skills so that they, they're, they're now like taking more kind of direct actions themselves because the, I think the tactic, the idea of direct action as a tactic as an, and a tool for the left and for like anti-cuts groups, I think that's something we've definitely wanted to give, like to empower people as a means of making effective change, being effective, being direct. Uh, so then in the middle of 2012, the action, this was the action outside Nick Clegg's house, the Deputy Prime Minister who lives here, this is his big house in Putney. And um, so it was the idea of like a, uh, it was at the time of the, the Jubilee and also the, um, the Olympics. And the idea was to have like um, a kind of counterculture sense of things, like uh, festivities, some sense of resistance of carnival, not directly opposing the monarchy or the, ju the, or the Jubilee, not directly opposing the Olympics, because that's kind of media suicide, mm -hmm. essentially. You'd be like, do you hate the Queen? Do you hate British success at the Olympics? It's like, no, but we do not like <laughs> austerity. So it's mainly about the timing, but using targets at that time in a slightly different way. So yeah, it was, this was like a roadblock outside Nick Clegg's house. It lasted for a few hours. It was beautiful sunshine, which was amazing. So lucky. It was a really nice day. And um, again, like good, strong mainstream media coverage. It was kind of like a spiky action, quite challenging power outside, straight under his nose saying, like, we're bringing the cuts home to you. Like, um, look where you live, you know, you have a lovely house, you don't really understand this, again, the idea of the 1%, the disconnect, the inequality, and doing it in a very visible, set, a very visible way that communicated it to people. And again, like the people who were there, the idea of the tone, the vibe was kind of family friendly, there's a family space, a kid's space, we had people doing an open mic session, it was very open, but like a fun, engaging, um, creative atmosphere which isn't very important because it basically the idea is like changing the idea that the, the image of protesters of being like a different type of person and um, sensing it's you, you are a protester, you can be an activist, but that doesn't, a protester activist doesn't mean you have to have a certain knowledge of a certain thing, you know, you can just rock up to a protest and, or do your own thing and that's, that's great. So again, yeah, another disabled people against cuts demo. This was blocking the entrance to the Department of Work and Pensions in central London. They also blocked the entrance to the Atos um, headquarters, Atos who do the um, work capability assessments of people, which throwing a lot of people off benefits. So there's like, again, like putting disabled people at the front line of the actions and like having speakers and talk, uh, speakers and music and com comedy, all those kind of things during the demo are quite important for us. 
and having disabled people as their own spokespeople as well, really important. And um, at the end of, this is probably our biggest action, and f this was media, media crazy for a whole week beforehand, because it had basically come out with the, um, the public accounts committee that um, they were grilling Starbucks, Amazon and Google about their tax avoidance. And tax had been in the news throughout the year. We had the Jimmy Carr scandal, we had other like, big corporates coming out as avoiding tax and other rich individuals. But um, this one really like, caught the public imagination. It was like our big, biggest day of action. We had like 40 to 50 protests around the UK at Starbucks um, chains. Um, the, actual, the actual idea for the protest, though, hadn't been directly about Starbucks. At the beginning, it was we, we were contacted by uh, women's groups who were really like, worried the fact that we, the cuts were essentially hitting working women with families the hardest, according to the Institute of Fiscal Studies. They were really suffering the hardest, so it was, and they were like, like, how do we fight back? Because the normal means of NGO or charity protest and petitions and you know, going to seminars with government officials just wasn't going anywhere. They were just being completely ignored. So they came to us and were like, discussing, we were discussing this. So we came up with this idea of doing a protest at Starbucks. Um, and calling it refuge from the cuts to change the chains of Starbucks into refuges and like other kind of services women relied upon that were being cut, like crashes as well and things like that. So that, that was the main, the main aim of that and it was a way of like targeting Starbucks but using that, that, Im that, that the, icon the iconic image of Starbucks, all that like media awareness and public awareness to then be able to talk about the cuts and austerity and its impact on women as the kind of like Trojan horse almost. I think one of the interesting things I'd like to point out though here is that it can be quite frustrating in the media narrative that comes out of these things is that the reason why Starbucks have like generously proffered some money uh, is that that scene is being a result of parliamentary pressure of like boycotts, consumer boycotts, whereas I think if you look at it, why is it that out of the three companies who are put before the public accounts committee, Starbucks, Amazon and Google, Starbucks were the ones who offered to pay up money? I would suggest that it may have something to do with the fact that they were targeted on a day of action at 40 of their chain stores across the UK and the other ones weren't. So I think that there is a direct relationship between our actions and that kind of result, which the media can't quite understand. We're always asked, oh, is it about boycotts? It's about boycotts. It's about boycotts. Consumer action is like no direct action. Civil disobedience, getting out on the streets is really what makes a difference. And I don't think the media have quite understood that dynamic yet, which is quite interesting. I don't know what that says. Something to think about. Um, right, okay. So, so this is our most recent action, which I'm going to show you a video of in a moment, briefly. So this was again coming up, revisiting the idea of the Nick Clegg street party action. Um, basically evolving targets, thinking about other kind of targets that work with political, uh, getting people involved, participating, they're quite spiky, quite sexy, quite interesting, quite challenging, and that kind of target the architects of austerity, the millionaire misery makers, to highlight inequality and in the fact that these are people who are like bankers, in the case of Lord Freud, or ex-bankers, millionaires, taking decisions which are hitting the poorest hardest, which they have no real conception of the difference uh, that it will make to their lives. Um, compared to their own rich lifestyles. So Lord Freud, for example, has a, a big like, uh, countryside mansion worth millions of pounds, and he also has this lovely uh, four-bed apartment in um, Hampstead, or Highgate, which um, you know, um, is ironic given the fact that he's putting through the bedroom tax. He was the architect of the bedroom tax. So this was a protest to... The idea was, who wants to evict a millionaire, which is a play on words of, obviously, um, who wants to be a millionaire. Um, and so it was like um, basically as a secret target. So people met at. I'm going to show you a quick film of how it worked, which you might find interesting. Have a, uh, am I like going over time? No, no, you're fine. I was just going to say there's volume. Okay, I think this the soundtrack on this is absolutely terrible. So it'd be probably oh, okay. better if there's not volume, but we'll see. It's the big one. So this is the start of the protest. Everyone met at King's Cross, and as you can see, the media pack. And so then, no one at this point here on the protest knew where they were going. They got on the tubes, like 300 people got on the tube, and then they got out of the tube together in like leafy North London, and they were led 
to a secret target, which turned out to be Lord Freud's house. And the police, uh, the police knew where we were going, so they must have cottoned on somehow. Um, and now you can hear the samba band, which is always important. So probably about two to three hundred people there, quite a lot of media. We had broadcast coverage from BBC and Sky, and they were like covered in most broadcast uh, mainstream. Um, sorry, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Print. That's it. So there are people were like watching, um, people doing speeches, and they were they were they were like writing messages to Lord Freud, what they'd like to say to him. And so yeah, this was the idea. It was like we were evicting you, like um, as a notice of eviction. And so it was about two or three hours. And as you can see, people like dressing up like in pajamas, and they were like, "There's an uncut removals van," and we kind of set up a living room there with like a bed and an armchairs and a lamp and a microwave. Okay, and then on the same day, um, there was a protest at. So this was a secret protest again. This was at uh, Ian Duncan Smith's countryside mansion in Buckinghamshire. So it's like a countryside pile which he inherited through his wife. And uh, again, it was kind of like done to, as a symbolic protest to show the kind of the, the inequality gap, the fact that also like the kind of elitist gap that he's like giving out all this kind of these uh, sentiments, this kind of these pieties about people having to suffer and put, tighten their belts and welfare scrounges. And he's living in this kind of Speaking as a Scot, I Mansion. say that because of our history in Scotland, 80% of the people in Scotland would be the same as the people in the South Scotland. So, I'm going to go back to the end of the first day in Scotland, for everyone. The ending of TFA, disability living allowance, and replacing it with personal independence payment, which means that half a million disabled people will lose their disability living allowance. They will also lose their mobility. They will, in effect, be made prisoners in their own homes. Under Section 7 b the Hypocrisy Clause, living heirs with many spare bedrooms, such as this one, can expect to be in the picture. I've been living here. Yeah. <laughs> but this is really nice, I must say. This is really, this is really Jane Austen music. Yeah. You have a bit here. Oh, uh, uh, very good. Nice. Yes, tennis court. Okay, but you get the general idea.